there is another possibility in this passage. Jesus could be saying something slightly different. As much as he was admiring the widow's willingness to share, perhaps he was also frustrated by what he saw. Perhaps he took pity on this widow who had been duped into giving her whole life to a system that would ultimately, he knew, leave her empty. In other words, maybe he saw this as an example of a widow whose house was being devoured for the sake of appearances, taken in by a system that was not about reaching out in love, but, by, but about building itself up in appearance. Do you see her? Jesus had just watched rich person after rich person offer token gifts to a corrupt temple. And when he witnessed this poor widow giving up everything she had, trusting in their authority, he couldn't take it. We don't have to look too far in our own lives to see this. After all, we live in the Madoff era. The era of spammers and schemers. The era of televangelists who make promises of healing and salvation in exchange for weekly access to a credit card. The truth is, in our world that more often than not robs from the poor to give to the rich, we know what it means to take advantage of the little guy. And frankly, so did Jesus. And if this is the case, maybe when Jesus says, this poor widow. He wasn't talking about money. Maybe he's calling out those of us in authority positions and begging us to be faithful stewards of the generosity of other people. The truth is, friends, either interpretation is possible. I sort of think Luke left it intentionally ambiguous. After all, the early church, like us, probably needed to hear both. Some needed to be reminded to share, while others needed to be reminded to use what they had been given wisely. But in case the readers didn't catch it the first time, Luke continues by using the temple as an example. We're told that after seeing people admiring the beauty of the temple, Jesus says, As for these things that you see, the day will come and not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. All will be thrown down. The truth is, by the time Luke was writing his gospel, this had already happened. The temple had been destroyed, and the people to whom he were, who was writing were left confused. For centuries, they had built their faith on the temple. They put their hope and trust and money into the temple, the place where God was supposed to reside, and they had just been forcefully reminded in no uncertain terms that it was just a building. And so Luke reminds them again, as he does throughout his gospel, that it's not the things of the world that matter whether those things be temples, or treasures, or tombs. What matters are people. In some ways, it's a warning about idolatry. Luke is warning his readers through Jesus to not be duped into believing that the things we have are what make us who we are, because they can all and will all be taken away. He's reminding us that our worth has nothing to do with our bank accounts, our positions of prominence, or our lack thereof. No, our worth is determined before we were even formed in the womb, and it's not about what we have or what we do, but who we are. And in case you've forgotten between last week and this week, you are, as I am, a child, a child of God. And in the end, what we have is each other. If anyone saw the new Facebook movie, The Social Network, the ringing message throughout is that it is completely possible to have all the money in the world and still be alone. Or in the words of the prophets John, Paul, George, and Ringo, Money can't buy me love. <laughs> Friends, it's Consecration Sunday. A day on which we give thanks to God for all the good things that are going on in our church and make our pledges for the year to come.
come. It's true that we are asking for a financial pledge, but I want to be very clear. The pledge you are making today is not simply about money. It's an agreement, a covenant, to share with one another because we realize that we can feed more sheep together than we can apart. Friends, we had a great year as a congregation in which we've been able to accomplish much more than I think any of us ever thought was possible. We set bold goals and we met them and set new ones. We sent people out to repair homes in Iowa. We prayed a member into a spiritual pilgrimage. We launched a new website that will reach out to the world and we committed to a new mission statement together. Feed more sheep. The truth is, none of it was about money. And none of the exciting things we are yet to do in the year to come will be about money either. Yes, money is often needed for ministry, but what we are really pledging to share is something we have in abundance. Love. And so as we make our pledges this year, we pledge not to the walls around us, for as we've been reminded, those are fleeting. No, we pledge to God and to one another in the hope that through our combined generosity, we might reach out in love to the neighbors who are yet to be with us. Some of us will be making a commitment to tithe, that is to give 10% of our income to the church in the year to come. Emily and I are making that pledge again this year. Some of us will be offering some percentage of a tithe to the church. All of us will be sharing our gifts. Because the gift of the church and the hope for our future is not in our bank accounts, but in each other. And the more we can remember that, the better off we'll be. The truth is, friends, it doesn't matter what term we use for money. In the end, our pledge of faith is about one word.